I, I retired in 2008, um, having worked for many years with the East Cumbria Countryside Project uh, um, as a countryside uh, recreation officer. Um, there were two of us actually, um, and I worked mainly in the uh, Eden district area. Um, and um, the title of my book, The Stream Invites Us to Follow, is actually a quote um, from uh, a guy called W.H. Hudson, who was a poet and writer living in East Anglia uh, around the time of the First, of the first World War. Um, and he was a very early pioneer of doing uh, guided tours in, in books. Um, and um, uh, I've always much admired his work. And this, I, I also suddenly realized, because I've been thinking quite a lot about um, the, the, how the book came together, and I'm, I'm very, very aware that it's a rather self-indulgent and introspective account uh, which is quite a lot about me as well as the Eden Valley. And it occurred to me as well that um, a posh way of describing it would be a stream of consciousness. And uh, so the stream advice is to follow could be a reference to the fact that it that it's a lot to do with all sorts of stuff that the journey um, as I progressed triggered lots of thoughts and worries about the environment in general and generally getting lots off my chest. Um, as I gradually walked the route, although unfortunately quite a lot of the the, uh, the River Eden, um, quite, there are quite long sections of the River Eden where there are no public paths which enable you to walk alongside the river. Quite a, quite a few sections I had to drive along and stop off at various points. And I was busy writing up scribbled notes um, and then going home and writing them up. Um, and I got very interested in the whole business of trying to write stuff. Um, I've, I'd obviously done quite a lot of writing over many years of working in nature conservation and countryside recreation, mostly long reports about various things. Um, and in fact, when, they, when the, uh, the publisher came to edit the book, uh, there were some remarks about quite a lot of my writing sounded like official reports, and I had to adjust, adjust those to make them more readable in a, in a, in a better way. Um, next slide, please. Hmm. Can't see the slides. The slide has changed, Dick, so it's now on the Malastang um, image. Oh, okay. I'm not going to be able to see them then. Possibly not. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, right, this, this is a picture of Watercut. Um, during my time with uh, the um, East Cumber Countryside Project, um, I, I, I was lucky enough to uh, take advantage of a, a scheme that was introduced um, when the northern part of England was um, designated uh, the, the, the um, year of the year year of the arts, the, and um, there were various regions around the country that were, were being designated as special parts um, of the arts generally. But it was the year of the visual arts in in the, in the north, and um, there was a lot of lottery money uh, available. And I was fortunate to um, put together a bid for lottery money, which succeeded. And the, the, the project was basically to commission a series of stone sculptures at intervals along the River Eden. Uh, Watercut was the, was, is the first in the series um, overlooking Malastang by a sculptor, a wonderful sculptor called Mary Bourne, who actually lives in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, and uh, the, part of the idea, the brief to the artist was that the sculptures should, <coughs> they had to be carved stone, um, but I, I wanted them to be sculptures that you could sit on rather than sculptured seats. So um, uh, th this water cup one is, is probably more like a throne and you can sit on it and overlook the beginning of the Eden catchment landscape, which is fantastic. Um, I was working with separate committees at each location 
consisting of local people and various experts. And um, interestingly, I'd imagine putting this sculpture right as, far, as near the source of the river as I could. Um, but the general feeling amongst the local people was that that would, wouldn't, uh, um, that the sculpture wouldn't be very visible. And they wanted very much for it to be visible um, overlooking the Eden Valley. So at their request, we moved the location and uh, uh, this was the result. Uh, next slide, please. The next slide is Pendragon Castle, um, which, um, well, it was, it was originally built uh, by a, a Norman knight called Hugh de Morville, Hugh de Morville, who um, is probably best known for the fact that he was one of the knights that helped to kill Thomas a Becket. And um, he built the, the original uh, castle, but it's more famous for being a resident, a, a, a resident uh, for for, for uh, the, a residence of um, Lady Anne Clifford, who was an absolutely incredible woman. In fact, that section of the path is called Lady Anne's Way, and um, uh, she spent a lot of time living at Pendragon Castle. Although she moved around her four castles, um, I talk quite a lot about the history of Lady Anne. Um, uh, she was uh, she lived in the 17th century. And um, she fought for a very long time, most of her life, along with her mother, to claim the estate, the Westland Estates. Um, and she had to fight a couple of very difficult husbands and uh, a father and, and the king. And um, she persisted in the long battle until eventually she inherited the whole estate. And she was actually 60 years old when she did so. And she spent the rest of her life uh, she lived for another 25 years or so, and she spent the rest of that time restoring her four castles, um, which were in a very, very bad state of disrepair. Um, and uh, Pendragon Castle was uh, what was probably her favourite little castle. Um, I lived at the time just over the the other side of Wildboar Fell, um, at a place called Fell End, and I rented a cottage from a chap called Raven Franklin who actually owned Pendragon Castle and was responsible for consolidating the ruined walls and making them safe and uh, making sure that they, they wouldn't uh, deteriorate any further. Next slide, please. Well, actually, remarkably, I've got a picture of Lady Anne, although it's a modern um, uh, uh, representation. Um, my wife Sue, just before we left Kirby Stephen to move into up, move up to Galloway, organised uh, a performance. Um, uh, Lady Anne was played by a professional actress who wrote a wonderful script, and the other actors were all local amateur actors. And it started off at Pendragon Castle um, with a quite a large audience standing around, and then we um, transported the audience in buses. From there to Kirby Stephen, where the performance continued, and Lady Anne mingled with the crowds there and talked to people at a, at a, a medieval market, and um, the uh, it, it really did uh, have the feel of, of how it must have been when Lady Anne was around. Interestingly, she never went to Kirby Stephen, as far as I can gather, because Kirby Stephen was a roundhead town, and Lady Anne, of course, was a royalist, so she mostly spent her time further north at Appleby Castle. Next slide, please. Actually, before I, before I proceed with, with the, uh, the next slide, I'm going to read a little bit um, from my book. Um, and uh, this is a little bit about how I started this the walk, um, having visited the source of the river and coming, coming back down uh, on, on the fell back down to um, the, the, the lower area uh, along Lady Anne's Way. As I stumbled down the hill, a pair of grouse hurtled out of the drab brittle heather in front of me, whirring and gliding, a feather's breadth from the ground on stubborn, stubby wings, and seemingly mocking my retreat from the moor with their call to go back, 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 back. At that moment, one of the frozen pools erupted in a turmoil of spluttering spouting silver, silver bubbles like a cauldron of boiling water. 
For a split second, I thought I'd encountered a geyser of hot spring water bursting through the peat from the subterranean depths below Blackfell Moss. Drawing closer, I realized it was frogs, a tumultuous tangle of copulating frogs rising to the surface in a frenzied orgy of vernal ecstasy. Perhaps the grouse were right and I'd been too hasty dismissive of the desolate moor. In being so preoccupied with watching and listening for manifestations of spring in the air, I'd been ignoring the ground beneath my feet. It was perfect. Water was going to be my regular companion as I traveled along the length of the river. And here was an entirely unexpected aquatic affirmation of renewal that lifted my spirits, filling me, filling me with an almost delirious surge of anticipation at the commencement of my journey. The now confident stream was gathering momentum, channeling its way along the bottom of the steep-sided gully it had gouged out over thousands of years. It eroded bank, its eroded banks are jagged with crumbling landslips, strewn with big broken slabs of stone that are testament to the water's more aggressive progress and continuing excavations after heavy rain. Scrambling down the slope into the gill, shut off from the wider landscape, I felt a profound sense of intimacy with the river. Then as I walked along its cloistered banks, the sound of rushing water filled the air like a chorus of voices chanting a mesmeric mantra from the basement of time. In fact, that follows a, a, a description of the um, landscape where the source of the River Eden emerges. And um, whereas I'd hoped that it would be a bit more spring-like, it was very wintry up there. And I'd been a bit disappointed not to hear any curlew or lapwing, um, which I'd heard uh, before I set off up there further down and on the lower ground. Um, so the frogs were a wonderful um, sight uh, and, and uh, um, uh, made me feel much better about that start of the year. I'd often visited the source of the Eden um, at, at, around that time of the year. And uh, uh, on this occasion, it was the beginning of the walk or the journey along the River Eden. The next slide shows um, a stone which is part of the poetry path at, um, at, at Kirby Stephen, just on the outskirts of Kirby Stephen. Some of you may know it. Um, this followed my work on the Eden benchmark sculptures. And I've often thought about the idea of combining um, sculpture with poetry. And um, we, uh, I, I managed to find the money um, once again, I was very lucky with, with money from various sources. And um, we commissioned Meg Peacock, who's a very eminent poet who happened to live on Stainmore, where she actually farmed on a small holding. And so she was an ideal um, person to deal with the, uh, the poetry side of it because she'd actually, she, she actually knew about farming. And the theme of the poetry part is a year in the life of the hill farmer. Um, the woman that did the letter carving is called Pip Hall, who now lives in Dentdale. And um, the, the Meg and Pip got on incredibly well. And uh, whereas I'd had various little ideas of my own about it, they quite rightly took over the whole thing and turned it into something quite amazing. Uh, next slide, please. This is the nine standards. Um, this is a, a, a group of nine huge stone cairns on the hill above Kirby Stephen. You can see them on the horizon on clear days when you look up from the town. And they become, they, they become, um, they, 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 they were very dilapidated. They're, some of them, one had fallen down altogether and the others were in quite a dangerous state. Um, so the idea was to, to uh, carefully rebuild them. Um, and in order to do so, as, as the next uh, slide will, will show, uh, that's the, the state of one of them in, its, in, a, in a ruined state. And um, the idea was that to rebuild them, we, we, we had a, 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 an archaeological uh, survey done, not a dig, unfortunately. I, it, I was told later that I should have organized a, a dig which didn't actually happen. But what did happen was a documentary survey going way, way back to try and discover the origin of the United Standards. 
and we did actually come up with some very old photographs. So we were able to rebuild the, the ruined cairns more or less exactly as they had been um, when they were first built. Um, and the next slide shows the, the completed work of, uh, of that main big cairn um, by a warner called Steve Allen, um, who's a champion warner who lives um, at uh, Tibay. And um, uh, they, they, he and a couple of other warriors managed to complete the work within about eight or nine days, which was just absolutely amazing. Next slide, please. One of my preoccupations um, with writing the book, and as I say, I did have quite a lot of things that, that um, writing the book stimulated uh, a lot of thinking about um, and as we're all uh, most of us are fairly concerned about the difficulties that, that are uh, that have arisen between modern farming and wildlife landscapes um, and uh, I, I was discussing quite a lot in the book the whole notion of finding ways of retaining uh, our wild flora, either along public footpaths, um, and of course, as the next slide shows, um, to try and save some of our wonderful old herb-rich hay meadows. Um, this is a picture taken um, at one of the hay meadows at Ravensdale. There are two ri incredibly rich hay meadows at Ravensdale, um, which, which um, used to belong to uh, Raven Franklin, um, the guy who at one time owned Pendragon Castle, um, and uh, he did a great deal to to uh, restore and improve these hay meadows um, during his lifetime. The next side, of course, is a, a group of Swaledale sheep, um, and uh, I've just put this in really to introduce that that whole debate about whether we can in some way find ways of uh, reconciling hill farming and i think i think it can be done um i i do suggest in my book that there is too much grazing on the fells um and i i realize that in saying that i'm being a um uh, a little bit um uh, controversial perhaps but um it is something that we have to address, and I know that in North Pennines you're uh, going to uh, doing a lot of wonderful work to address that question. Um, next slide, please. The route between Kirby Stephen and Walcott um, has almost no footpaths following the river, um, which is quite frustrating because it's a beautiful stretch of the river, and I had to resort to going along in my car and stopping off at various points. Um, this picture is actually uh, a restored sheepfold by Andy Goldsworthy. And um, I was very fortunate, I knew Andy Goldsworthy when he was a part-time gardener at Brough. And um, we got quite well acquainted before he started doing some work at Grisdale and then um, proceeded after that to become really uh, famous and working throughout the world on pieces of, of sculpture. And um, uh, Cumbria County Council, uh, uh, along with a guy called Steve Chettle, had decided to mark the visual arts year in 1996 when I started the Benchmarks program. They decided to commission Andy Goldsworthy to do a project which they called Andy they called uh, sheepfolds. The original idea was to restore a, a hundred sheepfolds throughout Cumbria, um, but the whole thing was fraught with difficulty. And then, in fact, Steve Chettle left, and uh, I was invited to take over from him, by which time I suppose half of the sheepfolds that were eventually achieved had been done. Um, I think something like 60 were, were actually restored in the end and, and combined with Sort of, uh, sculptural interventions, shall we call them. Um, and one of the things that Andy wanted to do was to restore nine pinfolds in the vicinity of Kirby Stephen, because when he was a part-time gardener, 
at Ruff. He was very inspired by the nine standards, as you can see from there. And that was what led to his very um, well-known, what he calls cones, stone cones, which he's built all over the world. Unfortunately, we only achieved six uh, because the, the, uh, the program had to be terminated in the end and there wasn't time to complete them. Um, this was one which, well, the pinfold had completely gone and um, we have managed to find the foundations and uh, Steve, Steve Allen and some of his walling colleagues rebuilt the pinfold and then Andy built the, uh, the cone inside it. Um, I was working with a wonderful parish council at, at Warcock and um, they were amazingly helpful and cooperative. Um, one of the things I also mentioned in my book um, is the reintroduction of water voles um, at Warcock. And this was done in conjunction with the army who have that huge um, army range um, on the Pennines which I think coincides with the uh, North Pennines AOMB and is also a site of special type of scientific interest in various other designations. And oddly, although I've you know, got mixed feelings about it, the army have definitely helped to conserve that area. Um, I had quite a lot of meetings with the people from uh, the, the army base there. And um, they agreed to help with a reintroduction of water vaults. Waterfalls, of course, as I think everybody knows, I think they're the, the, the rarest of all the, um, the British indigenous mammals. I think there's less than 10% uh, uh, left now in the whole country. Um, they've disappeared at a, a, a massively alarming rate for all sorts of reasons, river pollution, um, predation by, by um, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, America, uh, oh gosh, it's gone. Um, they, they, uh, uh, and then it was discovered that there was a small colony of, of waterfalls up up near Alston, um, and they they were able to take uh, the young of, of the last litters and um, breed them, uh, bring them on in captivity, and then release them. Um, and I say a little bit about. Um, about the water voles. Um, uh, sorry. Uh, in in the book, because um, I don't know yet whether whether it was successful actually, but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly hoping so. Um, sorry, I've kind of lost my way here. Um, Yeah, here we are. So this is this is um, a, a little bit about the the reintroduction. Best of all, the really good news is that Ratty is back. The name is a misnomer, of course. The consequence of a water vole's superficial buck tooth resemblance to the ubiquitous brown rat. The water vole population has plummeted in the last twenty years throughout the UK. In 1990, there were seven million but their numbers have decreased by a catastrophic 90% since. Due to widespread persecution, often because they are mistaken for rats, aided and abetted by habitat degradation and loss, conifer plantations, pollution from farming and sewage, and not least, predation by escalating numbers of American mink. Yes, I couldn't, couldn't remember that. Water holes have become Britain's fastest declining mammal. They had disappeared from lowland areas almost before anyone noticed and nobody thought to look for them in the harsher conditions of the uplands. Then several hill-dwelling colonies were found around Alston Moor, one of which extends down Hartside to Rennick, below the Eden catchment's eastern flank. A partnership between Cumbria Wildlife Trust, Eden Rivers Trust, and the Ministry of Defence snapped into action, taking advantage of the bull's prolific breeding cycle, which spans the period from early spring to late autumn. During this time, each female gives birth to approximately 30 babies, six or so at the time. This serial productivity is partly stimulated by the prospect of high mortality rate, rates every winter. The participating naturalists collected the weakest and most vulnerable last litters 
and these were incubated in captivity to provide a nucleus of adult breeding stock. In the summer of 2007, more than 70 were placed in soft release closures, well provided with food and bedding, along the lower slopes of the Walcott Army training area and left to burrow their way out to freedom. I hope they're doing well and their population is proliferating. They seem unperturbed by the incessant crash bang wallop of artillery, happily sharing muddy water-filled ditches with gun-toting commandos in camouflaged attire. There is every chance that Ratty and his expanding family will pick up a few useful tips on guerrilla tactics, preferably without lobbing grenades, on how to evade their enemies to find safer havens for themselves across the whole of the catchment. Next, next slide, please. Um, this is the Primrose Stone um, by a, a, a guy called Joss, Joss Smith. Um, this, this is uh, a, a, a sculpture which um, is both liked and hated. Uh, quite a few local artists dislike it, and, uh, but quite a lot of people absolutely love it. Um, it. It does work very well, actually, in terms of uh, sitting in it and enclosing, enclosing you in it. Um, children love it, and I think it helps to create a closer link with the river. Um, which is which is basically what uh, what was intended. Um, I'm keeping an eye on the time here, and I am burning a bit. Um, but um, I wanted to uh, read a, another passage. Um, um, Appleby, of course, is a wonderfully historic town. Again, uh, very much associated with Lady Anne Clifford, um, who did a lot of good work there, and. Um, I'd been visiting the church, which she repaired um, one day, and I came back out, and there were a couple of women sitting, eating, um, uh, eating their lunch in the cloisters, and I sat down um, for a little while, and um, uh, was horrified to notice that one of them had apparently dropped a paper bag on the ground. Um, I had decided to go back to the cloisters and explain to the woman that, sorry, um, after a brief, brief inspection of the church interior, I sat for a while in the open cloisters outside, opposite two young women who were devouring large baguettes. A discarded plastic bag lay at their feet along with the usual detritus of litter, despite the obvious nearby litter. I tried to ignore it, but the longer I sat there, the more the plastic bag seemed to assume monstrous proportions in my mind's eye, and as I got up to go, I succumbed to the grumpiness that seems to have intensified with my advancing years. As I pick, picked the bag up and deposited it in the litter bin, I informed them with polite sarcasm that I was doing so to compensate for their apparent ignorance. They emitted howls of protest, and the vigor of the two informed me cur courteously and patiently that it had blown off her lap, and she had every intention of retrieving it in due course. Apologetically, I retracted my accusation and scurried away. Similar misunderstandings understandings had happened before, and I wandered around the town for a while feeling contrite and embarrassed. I had that morning been distressed by a photograph in the Guardian spread across the centre pages showing the contents of a dead albatross chick's stomach. More than 400 items, including disposable cigarette lighters, toothbrushes and plastic bottle tops, Every year, tens of thousands of albatross chicks suffer hideous deaths from swallowing plastic debris brought to them by their parents who mistake it for the fish that are no longer in the sea. They pick it up from a mass of garbage three times the size of Great Britain, the plastic waste of nations floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I decided to go back to the cloisters and explain to the woman that this was the reason I'd overreacted to her temper in this place of the plastic bag. When I returned, she was standing talking with another woman who was sitting in a car parked nearby. I apologized yet again, described the photograph in the garden, and embarked on a lengthy explanation about the global repercussions of our throwaway society, my fervent concern for which leads occasionally to an overreaction when I see little bits of local litter. She accepted my apologies magnanimously, whilst her companion observed me with an amused smile from the open window of her car. <laughs> 
After a few moments, she informed me with a sardonic chuckle that she had guessed I was a guardian reader. So much for the rigor of my tale of global catastrophe. So next slide, please. This, uh, this is Red River, which is the next sculpture, uh, the one at Temple Salvi, bit by a woman called Vic Brailsford, who now lives at Hexham. Um, uh, it's a wonderful piece of work, um, and um, uh, a very exciting one to install. Um, the, the large stone balls are, are intended to represent magnified grains of sand, um, because it's all about the geology of the area and how the area at one time was a, a landscape of drifting sand dunes. Um, so it's, it's, it's a sculpture which explains something that can be quite difficult to understand very simply. Um, since it was installed, actually, the, the, the bridge has been put across the River Eden where the A66 was, um, was, was uh, uh, bypass to uh, avoid going through Temple Sabi and I often when I'm driving along there wish the sculpture was at least 10 times bigger um, because you can hardly see it from the road. Um, next slide please. This is uh, South Rising at Eden, at Eden Hall um, by a sculptor called Vivian Mausdor. Um, again a lovely piece of work. All of these, all of these um, photographs were taken um, not long after the sculptures were installed, so in fact they're not in quite such good condition anymore. One of the problems with red sandstone is it does go a very grey colour after some years. Um, one of the problems with this particular sculpture is that the intention was to um, uh, clear the willow below. I'd, I'd, I'd planted a lot of willow on a, on a, on a riverbank which had suffered a massive landslide and the idea was that the willow would um, consolidate the, the, the ground and then be coppiced periodically so that the roots would um, tie in with the, with the, um, the ground to hold it together um, but we would maintain the view of the river which unfortunately is gone. Next slide please. This is Lacey's Caves, a uh, picture taken by Val Corbett, a wonderful photographer who lives in Eden. Um, this was taken by on, on, on her phone, I think, on a frosty morning when she was just doing a, a casual walk along, along the way. Uh, Lacey's Caves is um, on one of the circular routes that I devised uh, in a project in partnership with the Eden Rivers Trust, which was an incredible experience for me. Um, I work closely with the Eden Rivers Trust to do fantastic work to restore the River Eden and conserve um, the wildlife associated with it. And uh, as part of that project, I devised 14 circular walks, um, one of which was the one that goes past Lazy Cave, Lacey's Caves and circles around to visit Long Meg and her daughters. Um, unfortunately, uh, as the next slide will show you, um, I, uh, I say I, the estate team that worked with East Cumbria Pensite Project built a boardwalk along there which, which to, to, to try and solve the problem of um, a very muddy stretch of the path. Um, but unfortunately the boardwalk has since washed out um, by the floods and I'm told that um, the County Council are now doing a lot of work along there and they're going to replace that boardwalk with flagstones and in fact they're working the whole length of that riverside path um, to do quite a lot of rest restoration, restoration work, not least realigning the path where quite a, a number of um, places uh, have tumbled into the river. Um, so they're actually legally uh, diverting the path to, to, to uh, take account of some of those landslips. The next slide is Long Meg, um, which is a wonderful place. Um, Long Meg and her daughters. Uh, ironically, Colonel Lacey, the guy that carved those, um, those caves as a feature on his estate, attempted to destroy Long Meg and her daughters. 
Um, but, uh, but fortunately, when the men arrived to dynamite the, the, the stones out of the ground, there was a massive storm with lightning and they took fright and thought that uh, they were displeasing um, the gods and consequently the, uh, the Long Meg and her daughters survived. Um, the next slide depicts a little plaque that was done by Pip Hall, a woman that did the, uh, the lettering at the Poetry Path and we, I commissioned her to make um, uh, a lot of these, uh, I think there was something like six on each each of the uh, discovery walks depicting some aspect of the either the local wildlife or the local cultural landscape um, and this depicts the witches that um, uh, legend has it were turned into stone for dancing on the Sabbath um, around the uh, long made of her daughters. Next, next slide please. Time's going on. Uh, this is Vista, uh, a, a sculpture by a, a young sculptor called Graham Mitchison um, in the middle of Coombs Wood, just before you get to, to Armourthwaite. Um, this, he'd, he'd imagined a, a, a story where a man had arrived um, and taken off his clothes and gone swimming in the Eden. Um, but I've discovered since that unfortunately locals have dubbed it suicide stone because as time has gone on, gone on um, they've wondered where this man has got to um, because he's apparently never returned to retrieve his clothing. It's a nice piece of work. Uh, uh, Graham created a, a sort of large ellipse of standing stones, one of which um, overlooks the river with, with these um, items carved on it. Um, the, next, um, the next slide uh, is at Weatherall. Um, and uh, it, it's a sculptor who's actually sitting in the picture, a chap called Tim Shutter, Flight, Flight of Fancy. And this is a wonderful piece of work. He's a, an incredible stonemason and carver. And uh, he, uh, he, you know, he picks cushions and, and, um, and so on with such realism. Um, unfortunately, it does get quite regularly flooded by, by the river. Um, but fortunately, it will withstand, um, withstand that as time goes on. Um, I have to say at this point that um, when I got as far as Armouthway, um, my walk had been taking quite a long time as it was, um, and partly because I was um, writing, um, trying to write uh, what was starting to look as though it might become a book, um, but purely for my own amusement. Um, but because of illness and also some personal tragedy in my family, I stopped altogether. My whole, the whole thing came to a halt, um, uh, although I got as far as Armourthwaite. And then sometime later, I recovered and got myself together and started, uh, started the walk again and, um, uh, and uh, joined a writing group uh, run by a wonderful woman at Kirby Steve called Vicky Bertram. And um, to my great amazement, she encouraged me to look for a publisher. And although I hadn't expected to ever uh, see it as a proper book, um, to my great amazement, the publisher took it on. And, and um, although it was subjected to some uh, very rigorous um, editing, quite a lot was taken out uh, because I do ramble on, as you've probably gathered. Um, but uh, um, having resumed the walk and finished the book, um, I, I proceeded via uh, um, Carlisle. Uh, the next picture shows this sculpture towards the sea by a wonderful Japanese sculptor called Hideo Furuta, who by coincidence lived in Galloway and worked in a granite quarry. Um, tragically died a few years ago. He was a lovely man and, and um, uh, it was a great trage tragedy that he died so young. Um, but again, I think this next to Watercut uh, is, is probably one of my favourites of, the, of the, the whole collection. And then we've got, on the next slide, the final slide, we've got uh, Global Warming. And uh, in fact, I do talk quite a lot in the book about um, uh, my worries about 
climate change. And I think I think I did actually witness with having had that delay and the long time that it took to finally arrive at a finished book um, with a lot of walking, a lot of driving, a lot of site visits. Um, and I'd been a keen wildlife enthusiast um, for all of that time. And um, I, I was noticing a depletion of particularly the birds, um, birds like the yellowhammer, which seemed to, seemed to have gone on the final section of my walk. Um, so I finish, um, finish the book uh, with this final reading. The birds and bees sustain our planet. If birds and bees are facing extinction, then so are we. It's taken us more than 50 years of carelessly discarding plastic to realize that plastic waste has been increasingly silently running riot in our oceans. More than 5 trillion pieces of plastic, collectively weighing 269,000 tons, are floating on the surface of our seas, and there are trillions more below the surface. Our time, over time, the plastic breaks down into tiny particles that are ingested by fish, and in turn by us when we eat the fish. And lest we forget, plastic is made in the first place from petrochemicals, the production of which is also a major contributor to global warming. There are, of course, some good things happening in the world, and wonderful people fighting a good fight to safeguard and cherish the natural environment and perpetuate our miraculous wild places. The barnacle geese on the Solway Marsh are an admirable, admirable example of what can be achieved. Propitious cons conservation measures 50 years ago saved otters and peregrine falcons from extinction, but nature conservationists and natural habitats are under siege like never before. Misguided or self-serving politicians and gangster-style dictators with egocentric short-term agendas are taking us over closer, to, ever closer to mass planet destruction. Most of us love the buzzing of bees and the virtuosic flight and music of birds, yet so many of us feel helpless despite knowing full well we are destroying Earth's biodiversity and wildlife. I still have a modicum of hope that political indifference to the natural environment can be overcome if enough of us who care about care shout loud enough in defense of our precious blue and green planet and its irreplaceable flora and fauna. But we are running out of time. So, I think that's probably the end of my allotted time. <laughs>